The creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, went to great lengths to conceal their identity. Many articles have been written on who Satoshi might be, and a man who continues to get attention is computer scientist Nick Sabo. Today we're going to talk about Nick and try to get an answer to the now 10-year-old mystery. Is Nick Sabo Satoshi? The groundbreaking Bitcoin white paper introduced the world to cryptocurrency, and the impact it's had is incredible. I doubt Satoshi could have predicted all of the advances in infrastructure, advances in tech, and politics surrounding Bitcoin. And yet somehow Satoshi understood the significance of the project. Satoshi planned every early step, using anonymous email services and Tor to register the domain Bitcoin.org, then releasing Bitcoin and slowly fading away over time, leaving only internet writings as evidence that they existed. A big point of Bitcoin is to not have one person in control of the project, and to not have one person guiding the community. But I'm not alone in wishing Satoshi was still around to give their opinion on the space. It's also interesting to think about, because Satoshi is likely sitting on about 1 million bitcoins, give or take. And those coins have not moved. To figure out what that's worth, go take a look at the price of bitcoin and add six zeros to it. Satoshi left almost no personal details in their writing, focusing really just on technical issues, coding, and answering people's questions. What we're left at for information is more along the lines of context clues to figure out what type of person Satoshi was. So who is Nick Sabo? Nick's father fought in the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, moved to the United States, so Nick is a first generation with a unique perspective on governments abusing power against their citizens. Nick obtained a computer science degree from the University of Washington and later a law degree from George Washington University Law School. Also on the resume is an honorary doctorate from the University Francisco Marroquin, joining the likes of Milton Friedman and Peter Thiel. Look at this title Wikipedia gave him. Nick is an interesting guy. Many consider him to be a polymath, a renaissance man. Someone who has a mastery of many subjects, including cryptography, law, economics, and history. He had a great archive of writing that is not up anymore. But if you don't believe me, check out his blog called Unenumerated. One of my goals is to read every blog, but it's taking me forever. Every article is dense with information, and Nick is able to write about very complex things in an easy to understand way. Enumerated type is a term used in computer science. And it's also a reference to unenumerated rights, which are those human rights not explicitly listed in law. So you see where I'm going with this. Nick's interests are Satoshi's interests. Freedom, cryptography, understanding sound money. If he's not Satoshi, these two would be best friends. I can't think of anyone with a more qualified background than Nick to speak on cryptocurrency. But similarities are one thing. What is the real evidence that Nick could be behind the username of Satoshi Nakamoto? This guy Bounty Hunter has been searching for Satoshi's identity for a while, and one technical piece of evidence they found was that in the very early days of Bitcoin, before wallets as we now know them, the software used to use your IP address to send and receive Bitcoins. On January 10th, 2009, Hal Finney and Satoshi were the only two people working on the project. Looking at the debug log, we see Hal's IP address. It's Hal's real IP, the same one hosting his websites. And this is Satoshi's IP address. They did use Tor, but this is not a Tor exit node. This is the IP address used by Satoshi on January 10th, 2009. 
And Bounty Hunter believes Satoshi was in Van Nuys, California on that day. It's hard to prove that Nick was in that area on that day, but he absolutely has connections to California. The company he worked for, Varum, which later became Mir, is based in California. Nick's a very private guy with his personal life, but he's a longtime member of the cypherpunk community out there. In the late 90s, he had an idea for a decentralized financial network. And the proposal got more attention in 2005, just a few years before Satoshi's Bitcoin white paper. Nick's write-up was called Bit Gold. I was trying to mimic as closely as possible, in cyberspace, the security and trust characteristics of gold. And chief among those is that it doesn't depend on a trusted central authority. There were many attempts at creating a digital currency, but few got as close to Bitcoin as BitGold did. Aside from similar names, BitGold also used a form of proof-of-work puzzle solving. If you check out Nick's unenumerated blog right now, his post on BitGold is dated December 27th, 2008. But let's jump into the Wayback Machine. Looking at old pictures of the internet, we can see that this was originally posted on December 29, 2005. The dates were changed. Why? It's suspicious. Like Nick wanted it to appear that he wrote it after Bitcoin, rather than before. Nick's life was building towards something like Bitcoin. Few academics had the knowledge set of economics, law, and computer science that Nick had to appreciate the white paper in 2009. So it's interesting that his blog output dropped after Bitcoin. Shortly after the first block was mined in 2009, Nick blogged what many believe to be an Easter egg. Annoying music, and it's a strange post in general for his blog. It's sandwiched between big write-ups on confidential auditing and the Polynesians versus Adam Smith. So what is this? What many have theorized is that this is Nick tipping his hat to solving the double spending problem. Nick's big gold proposal was never implemented. It was just an idea. And a big issue in the past with digital money was double spending. How can you make sure a bad person doesn't copy and paste their money? Satoshi found an answer with blockchain, and with the Bitcoin blockchain producing a new block every 10 minutes for about a month at this point, the video could be a small showing of satisfaction that the game theory appears to work. Even after reading all of Satoshi's writings online, it's hard to get a sense of their personality. One of the most famous things they ever said was that Bitcoin is bloody hard to explain. This is famous because it's a rare show of emotion instead of more technical talk, and it also appears to be a clue on who they might be. Bloody hard is a very British thing to say. Satoshi also used British English spelling for a handful of words. It made reference to people living in flats. That, along with the Genesis block message, it seems pretty clear that Satoshi could be from the United Kingdom. The big question for us is, Satoshi capable of planting false flags? Is Nick capable of planting false flags? In my limited experience creating internet pseudonyms, I've been quite distracted by the continual need to avoid leaving pointers to my true name lying around. Excess mail to and from my true name shared files, common peculiarities, 
misspellings in written text, traceable logins, etc. All kinds of security controls. Crypto, access, information, inference have to be continually on my mind when using pseudonymous accounts. The hazards are everywhere. With our current tools, it's practically impossible to maintain an active pseudonym for a long period of time against a sufficiently determined opponent. That quote is from 1993. So yes, Nick thought about these things. But back to the bloody hard quote. You might be asking, why would Satoshi say it was hard to explain Bitcoin if Nick had been explaining these things for over a decade? That's a good question. I met Mr. Sabo, a large bearded man, in March 2014 at a Bitcoin event at the Lake Tahoe vacation home of Dan Moorhead, a former Goldman Sachs executive who now runs a Bitcoin-focused investment firm, Pantera Capital. Mr. Sabo worked for Varum at the time. Mr. Moorhead and the other hedge fund executives in attendance dressed in expensive loafers and slim-cut jeans. Mr. Zabo, his bald pate encircled by a ring of salt and pepper hair, wore beat-up black sneakers and an untucked striped shirt. While he kept to himself, I managed to corner him in the kitchen during the cocktail hour. He was notably reserved and deflected questions about where he lived and had worked, but he bristled when I cited what was being said about him on the internet, including that he was a law professor at George Washington University, and the notion that he had created Bitcoin. Well, I will say this, in the hope of setting the record straight, he said acidly. I'm not Satoshi, and I'm not a college professor. People really want to know who Satoshi is. It's just interesting. And Nick seems to check a lot of boxes. But if we take a deep breath, Sometimes all it takes is a random person on Reddit to check our biases. Jorge Stolfi notes on Reddit, A common problem in those attempts to identify Satoshi, they all start by assuming that he was not only a cypherpunk, but a well-known cypherpunk, which is absolutely true. There were thousands of people on those early cryptography mailing lists. Is it any wonder that the two guys who produce material online and happen to use their real name are targeted as potential candidates to be Satoshi. Wei Dai, the creator of B-Money, is likely just as interesting as Nick, but he doesn't have the wealth of public material online that Nick does. Satoshi appeared to not know a lot about the crypto research that was going on at the time. When Satoshi shared the Bitcoin white paper around, Adam Back had to tell them about Wei Dai's B-Money. Then Wei Dai had to tell them about Nick Sabo's Bitgold. It's just strange that Nick would lie to these people that he knows in personal emails. Wei Dai expressed some doubt on the Nick theory. Sorry, you misunderstood when I said Nick isn't known for being a C++ programmer. I didn't mean that he doesn't know C++. Given that he was a computer science major, he almost certainly does know C++, or can easily learn it. What I meant is that he is not known to have programmed much in C or C++ are known to have done any kind of programming that might have kept one's programming skills sharp enough to have implemented Bitcoin and to do it securely to boot. If he was Satoshi, I would have expected to see some evidence of his past programming efforts. But the more important reason for me thinking Nick isn't Satoshi is the parts of Satoshi's emails to me that are quoted in the Sunday Times. Nick considers his ideas to be at least an independent invention from B-Money. So why would Satoshi say expands on your ideas into a complete working system to me. Incite B money, but not Bit Gold in his paper, if Satoshi was Nick. An additional reason that I haven't mentioned previously is that Satoshi's writings just don't read like Nick's to me. Satoshi claims to have started working on Bitcoin in 2007, and claims they actually coded it first to see if it was possible before writing the white paper. As an academic, it would be unusual for Nick to proceed this way. I also have to mention there's been some stylometry research where the writings from possible Satoshi candidates are compared to the white paper. Looking for commonly used words, formatting, unique phrases, and interestingly, Nick came out on top as most likely candidate to be Satoshi. But 
I, I actually think this is garbage. My issue is, is that the sample size used is so small, both in the text used and the number of candidates, that treating this like a smoking gun piece of evidence is, is really just a joke. What we'd really have to do is get a bigger sample size of Satoshi's writings and compare it to everybody who was on the early cryptography mailing lists. The fact that Nick is closer than, say, Adam Back to the white paper is notable, but I don't think it tells us anything one way or the other. So what's with the funny business on the unenumerated blog? Why silent when Bitcoin was starving? And why change around articles from the past? And I think the answer to that is it was just not a guarantee Bitcoin would be a phenomenon back then. People tend to look at the actions of people in 2008, 9, and 10 with the information we have on Bitcoin now. At that time, it was not something integrated into culture. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. And Nick just doesn't update the blog often. As it stands now, his most recent post was a year ago. Lastly, why would Nick put himself out there if he was Satoshi? Why do conferences, interviews, tweets all day? Why start Global Financial Access, which claims to be helping people access their assets around the world? Satoshi was clearly freaked out in 2011 after Bitcoin started getting associated with WikiLeaks and pretty much disappeared after Bitcoin came to the attention of the CIA. It makes more sense that Satoshi is someone we do not know about, someone who's not a public figure. So what do I think? Is Satoshi a Trump guy? If you're going to ask me, I don't think Nick is Satoshi, but I do think he's an interesting guy, and he's absolutely worth your time. The man coined the phrase smart contract. We owe a lot to Nick, and I wish him well in whatever he decides to do in life. Thanks for watching. Um, also, Bitcoin was born out of almost a religious fervor or political fervor. So it was, we are creating sound money to undermine central banks, possibly even to undermine central governments. And here, here's a fun thought experiment. I know some people who bought Bitcoin and was 10 cents or mined it before that, who never sold. What kind of person who has 50 grand in the bank or less sees their wealth in Bitcoin grow a million, 5 million, 10 million, 100 million, and never rebalances and never sells? It's someone a, who has... A a crazy person is the answer to that. <laughs> a, a crazy and, and, a, and a religious person, a person who has blind faith that this must succeed, but also who needs it to succeed, who, who views their hodling as a vote, as, as, a, as being part of almost a, we are going to change the world and the way we're going to do it is by hodling Bitcoin. And that forces the price to go up because there's no supply. Basically, we're limiting supply and that is going to undermine the global financial system and potentially the global political system. And they wanted that to happen.